A highly questionable bullpen decision and the lack of offense early cost the Braves on Tuesday night. And I'll tell you why the Atlanta Braves are due to have some luck go their way with runners in scoring position. All of that on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Lockdown Braves, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani, and you can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Also, check out my written work over at bravestoday.com. If you haven't read that piece on AJ Mentor, please go give that a read on AJ or on bravestoday.com. Talking about AJ Mentor and his struggles, uh, really. Uh, I think it was a pretty good piece. It was really in-depth. Put a lot of work into that one, so I'd appreciate if you would give it a read and let me know what you think. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. Send in any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for the podcast. Try to make this the best possible Braves podcast that it can be for you. Thanks so much for your support. You're subs- uh, subscribing on YouTube. You subscribe wherever you get your podcast. You hit that thumbs up button when you're watching on YouTube. It does help the show a ton whenever you do these things. And thanks so much to all of you who make Lockdown Braves your first listen of every day. And a big shout out to some of my everydayers who have let me know in the comment section on YouTube the past couple of days. Lauren Crump, Docs Cards, Jackson 2009, Greg Harris, Alex Pearson, 49er. Lewis says he's almost an everydayer. So I'll go ahead and give Lewis a shout out as well. Georgia Bulldog, Will, and Ray Day 33. Thank you so much for being part of the everyday gang here at Lockdown Braves. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. On today's episode, going to talk about Tuesday's loss to the Rangers. Very questionable bullpen management there by Brian Snicker. Also, just the lack of offense early in this game where it felt like they had some tw- chances that they let get away. And then I want to dive into runners in scoring position. It's a, a issue that the Braves have had all year long, and we're talking about how bad it's been, but why I think there's hope coming for the Braves with runners in scoring position. And then my top prospect in the system got a big – promotion on Tuesday as well. We'll talk about that at the end of the podcast and set you up for Wednesday's game. It is Strider Day here on Wednesday, so excited about that. But it was Jared Schuster Day on Tuesday, and I said at the end of the podcast on Tuesday, if he can give you five innings and three earn, consider that a win. And that's exactly what he gave you. Now, the way that he looked early on and how efficient he was, maybe he thought he'd give you a little bit more than that, but I I thought that was exactly what you needed from Jared Schuster and the Braves got it gave the team a chance to win five innings three hits two walks three earned runs three strikeouts a home run and 60 just 66 pitches like I said was very very efficient just a 20 percent whiff rate so not a lot of swing and miss just seven called strikes 94.6 mile per hour average exit velocity You, you watch where Sean Murphy was setting up and You know, he was regularly missing his location, missing his spot. So, you know, it was more control over command. You know, he was, you know, throwing more pitches in the strike zone, which we needed to see. I talked about, again, wrote an article on Braves today, what we need to see from Jared Schuster this time around. And it was limiting the walks and being more aggressive in the strike zone. I think we saw more of that. But, you know, he is a a fifth starter. Uh, And I think, you know, this is the result you can live with from a fifth starter. It's not an overly dominating profile that Jared Schuster has, but he has the ability to create some weak contact, especially with that changeup. You know, if he can locate that fastball on the edges and then work that changeup off of it, you know, he can have some success. But you could tell that second time through, they were really starting to get to him and have some better looks, particularly in that fourth inning when they scored three runs off of him. I know a lot of people maybe thought he should have gone back out for another inning. I was actually okay with that decision because, again, I saw Schuster missing spots a lot, getting away with some hard contact that was getting caught. I, I thought it was the right time to pull him because I thought the Rangers were really starting to to get better looks at him and get some good swings off of him. So I thought that was absolutely the right decision to pull him after five innings. And like I said, five innings, three earn. If Schuster can give you that every fifth day, I think you'll take that for him in that fifth starter spot. 
and he gave his ch- team a chance to win, which, again, is all you can ask for. Now, where this game really takes a turn and where I, I don't understand the thinking, you take out Jared Hughes over five innings, which, like I said, I agreed with because I thought the Rangers were starting to get to him and take better swings off of him. But you bring in Dylan Lee, uh, another lefty, who throws the exact same three-pitch mix as Dil- as Jared Schuster. And like I said, the Rangers were starting to see Schuster and take better swings off of him. And then you throw you throw in a guy who throws the exact same pitches and is also the same handedness. And so the Rangers have already seen this for five innings. And so, of course, they're going to have good swings against Dylan Lee. Now, Dylan Lee's got to execute. You know, he's got to do a better job and try to – get outs but I just did not understand that decision to bring in Dylan Lee there you want to bring in Dylan Lee later in the game when you got some lefties coming up that you want to get out that's fine but I don't understand the decision not to go to a righty there and look I get it McHugh pitched he's opener on Sunday and and that's why I need the Braves to just go back to a five-man rotation because I think These bullpen games are really messing with Brian Snicker's bullpen decision-making and usage, and that's really frustrating to see because you're giving away games that the Braves could potentially win, whether it was the game, you know, last uh, Friday where the Braves, you know, was a close game. It was a one-run game when Spencer Strider left, and you bring in Danny Young because you're worried about using your best guys because you need a bullpen game on Sunday. And now here we are on Tuesday, and you can't use some of your better guys in the bullpen because you just had to use them in a bullpen game. We got to stop with these bullpen games. You can do it every now and then for sure when you need to. And I know the Braves have just been devastated by injuries in the rotation very quickly. And, you you know, you kind of have to do that. But I think it's really hurting Brian Snicker's bullpen decision making because what he did on Tuesday night makes no sense. And I don't think it made any sense to anybody watching that game why you would follow up Jared Schuster, a lefty who throws fastball changeup slider for another lefty who throws fastball changeup slider it makes no sense and then what what makes even less sense is he brings him back out for the seventh inning you want to bring him out for the sixth okay I, I still don't get that decision but to bring him back out for the seventh it was almost like you were punting the game because again you're sticking with a guy that is very similar to the pitcher that the, that the Rangers saw all five, first five innings of this game, and then including the sixth inning when you brought in Dylan Lee. I, I do not understand the decision to bring Dylan Lee out for that seventh inning. It's one of the, the worst bullpen decisions that I think Brian Snicker's made in a long time. And I know a lot of people out there don't like Brian Snicker and his bullpen decisions. You try to manage a team for 162 games and manage the usage of all these bullpen arms and see if you can do a better job. But this was a no-brainer. Like you don't, you don't go to Dylan Lee in the first place, and then you definitely don't bring him back out for the seventh inning after he allowed a run in the sixth inning. You bring him out for the seventh inning, and the game just gets blown wide open. And again, you essentially just punt this game that was very winnable. It was a three-run game, even after he gave up that run in the sixth inning for an offense that's capable of putting up runs in bunches, as they did in the eighth inning. And you give the game away because you send Dylan Lee back out there now uh, admittedly the bullpen's not been great lately and who knows if you bring in joe jimenez kirby yates jesse chavez whoever for that sixth or seventh inning that it's any better but you didn't give your team the best chance to win the game on tuesday night and that falls on brian snicker again dylan lee's got to execute he's got to get the job done but that wasn't setting your player and your team up for success by making that move and then the one to Bring him back out again over the seventh inning. Again, that's the one that just blows my mind. I cannot believe he sent him sent him back out there for that seventh inning against the heart of the Rangers order after they had seen a lefty with the same pitch mix already for the first six innings of the game. So for me, that was the big blunder in this game. Yeah, the guys didn't ex- execute. Offense was frustrating early, which I'll talk about next, but the decision to bring in Dylan Lee and then to send him back out there for another inning, I just I don't understand it. And it's a big reason why the Braves lost on Tuesday night. Now, another reason the Braves lost is the offense was frustrating early. It reminded me of that game on Saturday against Toronto, where through the first six innings, had a lot of base runners. It felt like they had eight, ten runs, but they only had two. 
And it was the same thing on Tuesday night through the first six innings. Had a lot of base runners that felt like they should have had a lot of runs on the board, but they only had one against Dane Dunning, who somehow got through six innings. And I know he's a good pitcher. He keeps the ball on the ground. But, I mean, they were working the pitch count. It was getting up. I, I thought it was he was going to be lucky to get out of five innings. And he gets through six, allowing just one run. It was just a really frustrating game. You know, you go to the first inning, a leadoff single by Acuna to start the game, which he just continues to do to start off ball games, get on base. And then he ends the inning on first base. This cannot happen. You cannot have Ronald Acuna Jr. lead off an inning with a hit and stay there. I need to see him running in that situation. I know you have the fear of getting thrown out and then Olsen or Murphy or Riley go deep, which they're very capable of doing. But I can't have Ronald Acuna Jr. leading off an inning with a hit or a walk and then ending that inning on first base. That just can't happen, especially for an offense that's somewhat struggling to score runs without the home run. I got to see Acuna in motion. Acuna later in the third inning just missed a home run. It would have been out in 11 of 30 MLB stadiums, then Olsen singles, and then nothing else after that. Uh, and the second, you had second and third later in the fourth inning, and then Hilliard strikes out. Can't come up with that big hit with runners at second and third and two outs, which we'll talk about here in a second. Cunha stung a ball 115.6 miles per hour to start the fifth inning, but went right to an in infielder for an out. It had an expecting batting average of 690, then Olsen singled, but then Murphy grounded into a double play. We've seen way too many double plays out of the Braves' top of the order so far this year. Riley and Rosario had a couple of loud flyouts in the sixth inning that had expected batting averages of 660 and 310 respectively. So there was a lot of loud contact for the Braves in this game that unfortunately just didn't find holes. A little bit of bad luck, also just not executing and not working to manufacture runs and just waiting on that two, three-run homer. I know they got a lot of them on Monday, but you can't always expect that to happen each and every game so some frustrating offense early they did break out in the eighth inning Acuna finally did get that home run after he teased one the at bat before another 450 plus foot home run Olsen gets on for the third time in the game he took some really good swings on Tuesday night that were highly encouraging a couple of hits the other way and then pulled one through on the right side uh, where the shift would have normally been an easy out there. So he gets on base three times, got hit by a pitch, and then Murphy homers the other way. Good to see him get that power stroke going. He had cooled off a pretty good bit. And then Texas went to their bullpen, and it was pretty much lights out after that. Um, but this is why you can't ever count this team out, because they can score in bunches. And if you I hate to say Snicker didn't play to win, I know he wants to win every game, and Dylan Lee wants to win every game and do the best that he can. But I just feel like you didn't give your team the best chance to win by sticking with Dylan Lee in that seventh inning. Again, the way the bullpen's been lately, who knows if things play out differently. Jimenez gave up a home run in the ninth inning. But, you know, who knows? Because this offense can score some runs and munches, they can get those two and three run homers. But you let that game get away by sending Dylan Lee out for the seventh inning, a decision I just do not understand. But one, one area the Braves have really struggled in this year is runners in scoring position. They've been one of the worst in all of baseball, but a lot of that due to some bad luck, and they are set to, to break out of that and have some better luck with running, runners in scoring position. We'll go through those numbers next in our Stat of the Day Wednesday. So Rare is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. Been telling you about them all season long. You see them everywhere. I know a lot of people are into it. It's a lot of fun. I've been playing it a lot this year, and it is a lot of fun. You get two cycles each week, a three- and a four-day cycle, so multiple chances to win prizes, whether it be scarcity cards, game tickets, merchandise, signed jerseys. VIP experiences, the higher the competition, the higher the level you play, the better the rewards will be. But it's just a lot of fun to try to build these lineups with these cards that you have to compete against other players. So if you haven't tried it already, make sure that you go to SoRare.com slash LockedOnMLB. That's S-O-R-A-R-E.com to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's SoRare.com slash LockedOn to start playing today. 
Speaking of playing, the Braves and the Rangers will have a rubber game on Wednesday night at 7.05 p.m. Eastern. We'll see if Spencer Strider can go out there and get the Braves back in the win column. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Braves. All right, later this week or tomorrow, we will have our Through the League Thursday. I'm really excited to talk about what's going on between the Yankees and Blue Jays. It's been a pretty weird series there after the Braves left. A lot of feelings getting hurt. We'll talk about that on Thursday as well as what's going on in the NL East uh, where the Mets continue to struggle. It's fun always to talk about that. And then on Friday, we'll have our mailbag episode as well. So be thinking about the questions that you would like to submit for that episode. Also, make sure that you're subscribed to Locked On Sports Atlanta. You get the postcast on YouTube with me and Grant McCauley after just about every game. And you can also get the audio version of that in the Locked On Braves podcast feed. Now, it's our stat of the day Wednesday segment. And our stat of today is 231. That is the Braves' average with runners in scoring position. And maybe even higher than some of you might have predicted. But that is 25th in Major League Baseball. And again, it's probably no surprise to you who watch the Braves every day. The Braves have really struggled with runners in scoring position this year. Now, on the plus side, they do have the 13 most played appearances with runners in scoring position. They're getting runners on base. They're getting opportunities. They're just not cashing in on those over t- opportunities. One big reason for that, 15 double plays with runners in scoring position. That's the third most in all of Major League Baseball. That's tough to overcome, and that's huge rally killers when you just continually ground into double plays. It's you know become a a big issue for the Braves so far this season. 12th most strikeouts with runners in scoring position this year. Seven of the teams ahead of them have more at-bats with runners in scoring position. Now, you look at K percentage with runners in scoring position, more of an indication of how bad the Braves are at striking out with runners in scoring position, and they're 11th, have, have the 11th. Uh, worst uh, K percentage with runners in scoring position. So the Braves do strike out a lot. That is part of their game. But I wouldn't say that's the biggest reason why the Braves are struggling with runners in scoring position right now. You look at the Rangers, who the Braves are playing right now, they have the best average with runners in scoring position this year at 331. That's The second best is Boston at 286. So the Rangers, and you saw this on Tuesday night, they had those add-on runs in that seventh inning. They just kept putting the bat on the ball and finding some holes and driving runners with, sco- with runners in scoring position. And that's been huge for them early on, a big reason why they are leading the AL West. But that number does not seem sustainable. Hopefully we see that start to come down on Wednesday. Hopefully there aren't any runners in scoring position on Wednesday for the Rangers. Top five teams with runners in scoring position. Texas, as I mentioned, then Boston, as I also mentioned, Houston, L.A. Angels and Minnesota. Texas and the L.A. Angels have struck out more than the Braves with runners in scoring position. So, again, I don't think the strikeouts are the biggest reason for that. Boston doesn't strike out a lot with runners in scoring position. Twins and Astros don't either, but they have a lot fewer at-bats than the Braves do with runners in scoring position. So, I know a lot of people want to point to the strikeouts as a reason for that, and it is part, part of it. You'd like to see the Braves with the ball in play, especially with two outs, which is what we're going to talk about next. With runners in scoring position and two outs, the Braves are 29th in all of baseball with an OPS of 595. They are not getting those clutch two-out hits this year like we're so accustomed to them seeing them do over the last couple of years. They're not getting those big two-out hits so far this season. 450 OPS with a runner on third base. That is last in MLB. And we just don't need to let runners get to third base. Just hold them up at second. We'll take our luck and our chances there, which isn't much better, but still last in MLB in OPS with runners in scoring position, just seven runs batted in, or sorry, with runner at third, just seven runs batted in with a runner at third right now is tied for the fewest in major league baseball. Again, you watch the Braves every night. Like I do, you know, Braves offense, they get a runner on first, they hit a two run homer. You know, they're not they're not getting those big hits with runners at second, with runners at third. It's just not coming through right now. They're 19th in average in what fan graphs considers high leverage situations at 246. So again, not coming through in those clutch spots. Now, this is 
partly due to the strikeouts in this situation. In the high leverage situations, Fangraphs has the Braves with the second worst K percentage at 27.9%. So in high leverage situations this year, the Braves are striking out almost 28% of the time. That is a big problem with the strikeouts there. Only six sacrifice flies this year is tied for last in Major League Baseball. Not doing those little things, driving in runners at, from third, uh, which is a sack fly with less than two outs. Now, one thing I do want to par- point out, and this is part of the reason why I think the Braves are going to come out of this, and typically with runners in scoring position, it's going to even out throughout the season. They're, they have a 269 Babbitt, batted average on balls in play with runners in, in scoring position this year. That's 26th in Major League Baseball. You combine that with the fact that they are first in hard hit percentage with runners in scoring position, this, this is going to level out. The Braves are going, they're due so, for some good luck. Their batting average on balls in play is one of the worst in baseball, but they hit the ball the hardest, which is not a surprise. The Braves are the best in the league just in any situation and hitting the ball hard, but they have the hardest hit percentage with runners in scoring position of everyone in baseball, and their BABIP is that low. They're due to come out of that and for it to normalize some. They make soft contact just 9.4% of the time with runners in scoring position. So, yeah, there's a lot of strikeout in there, but they're also, when they when they do have those opportunities, they're hitting the ball extremely hard. They've just had some really bad luck, and we've seen it over the last week or so, some great diving catches specifically in the outfield with runners in scoring position that have cost, some Braves, cost the Braves some runs. So just real quickly, looking at the individual performances with runners in scoring position, Travis Darno, Sean Murphy, and Acuna all have an OPS over 1,000 with runners in scoring position, just nine at-bats for Travis Darno, so not a big sample size there. Arcia, Grissom, Pilar, and Albies all have an OPS over 845 with runners in scoring position. Von Grissom, and I mentioned this while he was up, he came up big in some key spots with runners in scoring position. 16 at-bats with runners in scoring position, he hit 438, and that is due to the fact that, that he puts the bat on the ball in those situations and his ability to just take the ball the other way, which we saw him do several times. Matt Olson has a 703 OPS, but is hitting just 159 with runners in scoring position. Riley's hitting just 140. Rosario, Michael Harris, and Ozuna all have an OPS lower than 510 with runners in scoring position. Now with two outs, Acuna, Arcia, TDA, and Ozzy have been good. Everyone else has pretty much been terrible. And Acuna's been great at everything. It's probably no surprise to you, but RC has been fantastic as well. Now, individual high leverage situations, Rosario has been the best with a 417 average. Again, he comes up in those clutch spots. So has Pilar this year, a 400 average, just five at bats in, high, in what Fangraphs calls high leverage situations. Acuna, again, up there at 273. Riley actually up there at 250 and Murphy at 231, but everybody else is under 200. Albies, who's good with runners in scoring position, he's actually batting 077 in what Fangraphs determines as a high leverage situation. Now, again, these things will level out. The good news is the Braves are 10 games over 500, and not much has gone their way in these big spots so far. So I think you know that's news for good things to come. An indication of good things to come is probably a much better way of saying that. I think this will level out. Braves have had a lot of batted ball, bad luck so far this season with runners in scoring position. So, again, they've been great. Their record is great. And I think once this starts to get going, they get these hits with runners in scoring position, they're going to be even better. So, while it's been bad, I think there is hope for better things to come with the Braves and runners in scoring position. All right, next, I want to talk about A.J. smith Shaver and his big promotion, what that means. Could we see him in the big leagues later this year? We'll talk about that next. I'm fortunate to work from home, so I know all about the comfort when it comes to wearing clothes. With many, with my different jobs that I have, you know, doing this podcast, working my full time job, taking care of the kids, I need clothes that are comfortable and give me the versatility that I need for my different roles. And that's why I'm glad we're teaming up with bird dogs. And you've heard of bird dogs a lot lately on the radio, become a very popular. Uh, clothing line that they have going on, especially for their shorts, which I have and really enjoy. They give me the comfort and fit that I desire, but they're also also stylish enough that when I do take the kids to school, I don't look like a complete slob out there in my gym shorts anymore. So really 
glad that we're teaming up with bird dogs and able to, they sent me some of their product as well. So that I've been able to use that and you can wear them pretty much anywhere in any situation. Again, playing with the kids, playing around the golf, going to a meeting, just hanging with friends. You can wear them in just about any situation. You look good. They're stylish. They feel good. It's exactly what you want from a pair of clothing that you put on. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Please, please do this. If you want to support the show and you want to check out bird dogs, go to lock, uh, go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Use that link and then enter the promo code locked on MLB. They'll throw in a free custom bird dogs, Yeti style tumbler with every order. Again, one more time, birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. And then the promo code locked on MLB. All right, we'll wrap up this podcast with some news and some big news as the Braves are promoting A.J. smith Shaver to AAA after just two starts at AA. This seems highly aggressive, as I tweeted out on Tuesday. I'm as big as anyone on A.J. smith Shaver. He's been He was my top-ranked prospect coming in to the season, and he's been great. He hasn't given up a run so far this year, knock on wood, in 21 innings. But this is surprising to say the least, for A.J. smith Shaver. Now, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. I, I think, one, it has to do a lot. I shouldn't say a lot, but I think part of it is the fact that the Southern League, the league that he is now pitching in and would continue to pitch in at Mississippi, is experimenting with these more tackier baseballs. And I've seen a lot of other organizations who have moved their top pitching prospects or their top prospects in general out of the Southern League and up to AAA, even if it's a bit aggressive, to get them away from this baseball, which it sounds like nobody really likes, and hopefully they go away from soon. There's also the fact that the Braves are having to use a lot of those pitchers in AAA at the major league level right now. It's, we saw Schuster get called up. We're probably going to see either Dodd or Soroka get called up soon. So the Gwinnett team needs some starters. And why not see what A.J. smith Shaver can do? He has been very dominant, and I think the Braves feel like he can handle that competition. I also think there's a very real chance if he goes up there and struggles and then the Braves rotation at the major league level gets healthy and you send some of those guys down that we see Smith Shaver go back to double a at some point. But I think this is, you know, has a lot of several, you know, a lot of different factors that are playing into it. I think the tackier balls and double a Southern league right now are part of it. Also think the Braves really like what they see from him and he has been dominant and they want to see if he can handle uh, the triple a competition. So a very big move for AJ Smith Shaver. Now, do we see him this year? Uh, he'd have to go on a pretty good run of success at triple a, I think to get an opportunity. Uh, he hasn't thrown a lot of innings. He's hasn't even thrown over a hundred innings at the professional level so far. And they really haven't pushed him deep into games yet either. So it's hard for me to envision him getting an opportunity as a starter this year, but I think there's a good chance that maybe they could use him as a reliever at some point later in this season to kind of save his innings if you wanted to do that. But it's really exciting. Again, I love AJ Smith Shaver. It's that big fastball slider combination. I know a lot of people have somewhat been comparing him to uh, Spencer Strider, at least in the way that he's moved quickly through the system and he kind of has a similar arsenal. I wouldn't quite go that far on him yet, but it is very, very exciting to see what he can do. And I really can't wait to watch him at the AAA level. Should be a lot of fun uh, to see him there. Now on Wednesday, it's Spencer Strider versus Nathan Evaldi. Strider, you know, need a dominant start. You know, it goes without saying. You know, what will he do this time? Again, he's must-watch TV every time he goes out there. I don't really have any keys for Spencer Strider anymore. Just go out there and do what he's been doing pretty much since he has gotten called up. Same, you know, same thing I would say to A.J. smith Shaver. Just go out there and keep doing what you've been doing because that looks pretty great so far. Now, the Rangers have the fifth most strikeouts in baseball, so perhaps could be a good thing for Strider to rack up, rack up some strike, strikeouts in this one. Uh, talking's becoming difficult at the 28-minute mark here, so I do apologize. Nathan Avaldi hasn't given up a run in his last three starts. His last three starts, nine innings, three hits, no walks, no earned, eight strikeouts, eight innings, five hits, two walks, no earned, five strikeouts. What a bad outing that was. Eight and two-thirds innings, three hits, one walk, no earned, 12 strikeouts. This man is on another level right now. I think he's up to about 28 and a third innings pitched without giving up a run. So he is on quite a roll. Uh, not great for the Braves offense, but you know, all good things must come to an end. And hopefully that's the case on Wednesday night. Evaldi, 96 mile per hour fastball, 
deadly split finger hitters are hitting just 175 against it this year, 36.3% whiff rate. Cutter gets hit the most. Uh, that's been his worst pitch so far this season, but he has a 37.5% whiff rate on that curveball as well. Doesn't walk many batters, as you just heard, only three walks in his last three starts. Uh, gets a lot of ground balls to the pull side. Uh, so, you know, again, with that that splitter that he has, going to be a tough matchup for the Braves for sure, especially with the run of Aldi's on. Should be a fantastic pitching matchup between him and Spencer Strider. And the Braves and Rangers will play that game on Wednesday night at 7.05 p.m. Eastern. We'll see if Strider can get the Braves back in the win column in that great pitching matchup against Evaldi. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Braves. That will do it for this episode of Locked on Braves. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for making Locked on Braves your first listen of each and every day. And another big shout out to all my everydayers out there. Make sure that you subscribe to the Locked on Braves podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on YouTube at Locked on underscore Braves. Follow me at Shortstop Ball. And that will do it for this episode of Locked on Braves. And we will talk to you next time. 